Good evening. It's great to have everybody here this evening. Uh, we're looking forward to this uh, Wednesday midweek Bible study. And we're so great that you can be here with us for our uh, summer series. Uh, excited to get this started. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to introduce to you all Nick Fowler, who is the preacher at the Mill Creek Church of Christ outside of uh, Nolensville. Nolensville, thank you, inside. inside of Nolensville, outside of Nashville, there you go, I'll get my thoughts together eventually, Nick did share with me a little bit about himself, I know him uh, when I was in the Winchester area working at Tim's Ford State Park, he was the youth minister at Al Hala Church of Christ, which is just down the street, and my boys hung out during youth devotionals and stuff with their youth, so uh, we know him from there. But Nick uh, considered himself a broken sinner, saved by the grace and mercy of God, given the opportunity to equip God's people for discipleship and new growth. Uh, he's uh, been married for 19 years. He has a 14-year-old son and a 9-year-old daughter, and they're from the Franklin County area originally now serves the church uh, at uh, in Nolensville. He uh, also served as a church planter in North Brazil for seven years and uh, currently at the restart at Nolensville uh, and doing great work there. He is uh, he studied at Freed Hardeman University and he also studied at the Sunset International Bible Institute uh, for missions and the Erickson Coach, uh, College of Coaching and Certification. Nick is a devoted man to uh, sharing God's word, and uh, I've kept in touch with him as he was uh, in Brazil doing that work and had followed his work there. Uh, so he has a passion for sharing God's word and equipping men to carry on that work. So uh, excited to have him with us tonight. So we're going to turn it over to him and he'll start us uh, in the service just as soon as we bow for an opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to come together as your children to spend this uh, time in worship and study of thy word. We ask for your continued blessings on these Wednesday night uh, summer series and the study of the church foundations, the principles, first principles and uh, church 101 as we learn the basics of the faith and how we can share that with those around us so that they too can understand your plan for reconciliation for each of us back to you. Be with Nick as he shares his lesson with us. Uh, may he have a ready recollection of all the material that he has uh, prepared for us, and may we listen with open hearts to hear the message he has to share with us, and that through it we will grow in our knowledge and understanding of your word and our role in sharing that word to others. We ask for your blessing at this time on each and every member here at the McEwen Church of Christ. We ask a special blessing upon those that are on our prayer list, those that are dealing with illness and sickness, uh, and those that are recovering from surgery. Uh, be with them and comfort them as only you can. Continue to be with uh, the elders and the deacons uh, of the church here as they make uh, decisions for this church. May we uh, always seek your word for guidance and directions in the things that we do. We ask for your continued blessings upon Hobie and his family as he ministers with us, uh, and special blessings also on Keith and his family as he ministers to our youth here uh, at this congregation. We are so thankful for all the many blessings that you give us each and every day. And uh, we're most thankful for our ability to give back and to do outreach to the communities around us uh, and to assist with uh, flood recovery efforts, not only here locally, but also in Kentucky 
uh, and we want to bless, <coughs> uh, have a, uh, we ask for your blessings upon the men from this congregation that made the trip last yesterday to carry some supplies there. And we're so thankful for the, the work that they were able to do on behalf of this congregation. Be with us now as we uh, continue in this hour of study. Uh, may we put the worries of this world away and that we would uh, pay attention to the message being shared with us. And through our lives, may we be an example to those around us so that they will seek to find out what we have and that others will be brought to uh, Jesus through our actions. All these things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Oh, can y'all hear me better? I'm so sorry. All that nice stuff I said about you, you missed it. Okay, here we go, here we go. Um, what I want to share with you tonight needs to become basic knowledge. It needs to become answers that we can give our children, answers that we can give our teenagers, our college students, those who are out of high school, those who are new to the faith. Because for so long, when we talked about trusting in the, in the Bible, in the Word, we basically had to ask people, please trust the Word. You know, just please trust the Bible. And what's happened is now the resources are out there with, for access to people who are adamantly and vehemently trying to destroy our faith in the Bible and trying to break our trust in the Word. That may not be the case with any of you here tonight. It may not be the case. But it's very possible that tonight in our auditorium that we have someone who doubts just a little bit, who's heard something and they wonder just a little bit. I, I just I kind of wonder. And maybe, maybe, maybe the, that person at my school or the person at work or that guy I watched on YouTube, I mean, maybe they've got a point, just maybe. And I want to show you tonight that it's quite likely that they don't. And a good understanding of what this book is and how it comes to us gives us something that we can really trust in and something that we can stand on. Um, a lot of people say that they wish God would speak to them. Wish God would speak to us. Uh, no, you don't. You don't really want God to speak to you. And I'll give you some examples. Adam and Eve. God spoke to them, right? Look what happened. Um, Noah. God spoke to Noah. Look what happened. I'm not saying Noah did anything specifically wrong other than the way that he maybe fell off the horse at the, uh, after the flood and when he planted his new vineyard. But look at what he went through. Abraham. I mean, God spoke directly to Abraham, and Abraham lies, and Abraham lets his wife be taken as someone else's wife, and does it more than once, and he takes a, a different lady to be his wife, who was his real wife's maidservant, and later on, we know he has multiple wives beyond just those two, and God spoke directly to him. In fact, God spoke to Abraham, spoke to Isaac, and spoke to Jacob. You know who the first one of the patriarchs he didn't speak to was? Joseph. And there's more chapters 
in Genesis about Joseph than there are all those other guys combined. And Joseph, he maybe starts off like a, a kind of a proud, uh, immature, you know, young man that gets himself into trouble, but every step of the way after that, he's the one that grows and gets his people out of the mess that they're in and eventually sets them up for God to really do some big things that are eventually going to lead us to Jesus Christ. And so I don't know that we want to say, I wish God would speak to us. Even if you just look at the Israelite nation, their history, I wish God would speak to us. Why? Every time God comes in and speaks to someone, and speaks to people specifically, it's because there is a time when obviously humanity is going to fail. And so God did something for us. He gives us the living word, the written word. And he says, I'm going to take the living word, I'm going to make it a written word, and that written word is going to be something that all people can have for all time. That is an amazing thing that he's done for us. It's just incredible. We didn't have to be there when Abraham heard words from God. We didn't have to be there when Moses heard words from God. We didn't have to be there when Peter or Paul were given words from God because they wrote them down for us. And that's an amazing thing. Hebrews in chapter 1 and verse 1 says that God spoke to our fathers through the prophets at various times and in different ways. You think about that. Is that true? Did God speak to the forefathers in various times and different ways? Well, he spoke to Abraham in the beginning. He spoke to Noah thousands of years after that. He spoke to Abraham hundreds of years after that. He speaks to Joseph, speaks to Samuel. I mean, he speaks to all these different people all across the spectrum for a long period of time in lots of different ways, right? Face-to-face uh, -face in a whirlwind, um, burning bush, angels, dreams, visions, donkey. You know, I mean, a lot of different ways, right? But then he says in verse 2, but God speaks to us in these last days. He speaks in these last days through his son, Jesus Christ. And so we're like, but Jesus doesn't come talk to me. A lot of people say, well, if Jesus comes to my door, then I'll listen. Or if Jesus comes and knocks, you know, really? Would we? Would we really listen? I don't know. That, I don't know if that would make any difference for us. But Jesus doesn't come knock on our doors. In fact, he says that, he said in John 17 the, to the Father, he said, the words that you've given me, I've given them. He just spent the last three chapters, 14, 15, and 16, focused in. It was one night, one big event. After the, the, the washing, when he washed the disciples' feet and they took the Lord's Supper, they had this one night, and he spends three chapters talking to them about how the Holy Spirit's going to be given to help, help them remember everything. And sometimes we take like John 16, 14, we want to apply it to ourselves and say, well, the Holy Spirit will guide me into all truth. Really? Is that what he was saying? No, Jesus was talking to his apostles, and he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll guide you into all truth. And then what did they do? Well, I love what Paul says in Ephesians 3. He says, the mystery that's been revealed to me, I've written down for you. I've written it down, Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5. And so you can see the progression of God speaks through Jesus. Jesus gave, gives his word to his apostles. And, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, they write it down and preserve it for us. And it's a beautiful word. It's Holy Spirit driven. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21 says, None of it comes from man. None of it comes from man. But the Holy Spirit guides holy men of God along to write the word. But you know what? Paul wrote letters that aren't in our Bible. Peter wrote letters. James wrote, we have letters from Barnabas and letters from all kinds of different people. They're not in the Bible, so why aren't they in the Bible? They're not in the Bible because the recipients didn't recognize them as the Word of God. They said, these are different. These are above par, and these aren't. And so we have something that 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 describes really well, and that is that all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed. The world wants to, wants to take a uh, chip away at our faith by saying, no, it's not all God-breathed. You know, people wrote that down, and people are fallible, and people could mess up, and this was done by people, and it might have some truth in it, but it's not all 100% truth. Verbal plenary inspiration says that every word found in the Bible is given to us by God, 
And everything in the Bible is authoritative. And every word is divinely directed. And that would mean it's, in, it's infallible. If it all comes from God, and He's a perfect God and all-powerful God, then He cannot make a mistake. So it's, an, it's infallible, and it's inerrant. In, in the book of Titus, in chapter 1, he plays off a couple of things. In verses 2 and 3, 1 and 2, he talks about the truth, and he says, you know, God can't lie. There's no falsehood in the truth. There's no falsehood in the Word of God. And, but then he says down in verse 12, you know, the Cretans have a saying, and we know they're liars. And even there's some truth in that lie. So he's comparing and contrasting truth found in the Scriptures with truth that is found in other places that even comes from the mouth of liars. Because the Bible is infallible, it is unable to deceive. Romans chapter 3 and verse 4, it says if everybody in the world is a liar, God still won't be a liar. And that's the truth. You can count on that. It, it, and I bet a lot of us have been hurt by lies. I bet a lot of us have, have just relationships destroyed, trust broken. Here's the thing. God's not a liar. God cannot lie. He would cease to be God if he lied. And there's no way that he can do it. Some people say, well, God can do anything. No, he can't. He can't lie. He can't violate his own nature. The scriptures, as they're representing God, will never lie and can never be wrong. I have some, some quotes up here I want you to see. And I've got one from the 1st century, 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century, maybe the 5th century if I remember. These are people who were God followers who talked about the Scriptures back when they were first written. Not inspired people, not people who walked with Jesus, not people who lived with Jesus, but maybe even some of these may be people who knew people who walked with Jesus. Listen to what Clement of Rome says in the first century. You have searched the Scriptures which are true and given by the Holy Spirit. You know that nothing unrighteous or counterfeit is written in them. Let's see. I, I think I hit this more than once. Irenaeus of Lyons in the second century, all scripture which has been given to us by God is perfectly consistent. The parables harmonize with the passages that are plain and statement with a clear meaning serve to explain the parables. Justin Martyr in the second century, I am entirely convinced that no scripture contradicts another. Tertullian of Carthage in the 3rd century, the statements of Holy Scripture will never contradict the truth. And then the fourth one. It is the opinion, this is Athanas Athanasius of Alexandria in the 4th century. It is the opinion of some that the Scriptures do not agree or that the God who gave them is false, but there is no disagreement at all. Far from it. The Father who is true cannot lie. Do you see this? I'm picking one from each century for us to see. that The theme throughout is that the Scriptures were trustworthy even back when they were first given. One more from the 5th century, Augustine of Hippo. I have learned to give respect and honor to the canonical books of Scripture. Regarding these books alone, I most firmly believe that their authors were completely free from error. If in these writings I am confused by anything which appears to me opposed to the truth, I do not hesitate to suppose that with either the manuscript is faulty or the translator has not caught the meaning of what was said or I myself have failed to understand it. Basically, he says, there may be a lot of different ways for the truth to not prevail, but God and his scriptures are not one of them. Maybe, maybe it was copied wrong. Maybe it was translated wrong. Maybe I didn't understand it right. Or, so I, maybe I was wrong in my understanding, but God and his scriptures are not going to be wrong. Is the Bible enough? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says that it equips us, it gives us what we need for every good work, for all things. That's what these two passages combined tell us, 1 Timothy 3, 17 and 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. What does that mean? It means the Bible is enough for your marriage. The Bible is enough to be a parent. The Bible is enough to be a child 
to be a son, to be a daughter. It means the Bible is enough to help you in your job. It is enough to help you if you are a computer programmer, if you are a biologist, if you work in retail, if you swing a hammer. The Bible is enough in every situation. There is nothing that we need to know for a life that is faithful and follows God that is not in that book. Nothing. And so, the Bible is a beautiful work. And it is worth more than anything else that exists on this planet. There are certain religions that have collected artifacts, and maybe you've seen some movies, you know, like Indiana Jones, where they try to collect religious relics and artifacts. You know, it doesn't matter if you find the actual cup that Jesus drank out of that night with his disciples. It doesn't matter if you find the lost ark. It doesn't matter if you find, you know, an actual piece of the wood that's been preserved that Jesus was crucified on or one of the nails that went through his hand. None of that compares to how important the Scripture is. None of that leads us to faith. None of that equips us to every good work in life. In fact, it would just be a distraction, wouldn't it? And so, let's take a look at the Bible for a few minutes. Ancient writing fundamentals. I want to show you real quick, Old Testament, New Testament transmission. We won't have time to do canon, canon, canonization or translation, but I just want us to kind of see where did the Bible come from, and I think that gives us some faith to stand on. I think it gives you something where you can pick this up and you go, you know, this really is important, this really is special. Uh, number one, a lot of ancient writing was done on stone. The oldest written, the oldest written name of God, say God's name, written in human form, okay, with letters and stuff, I saw it. It's on a piece of stone, and when I was at Freed Hardman as a student back in, I don't know, 1998 or something, there was a, uh, somebody that came through, and they had a display at Vanderbilt, and they had a piece of stone that was from 600 B.C., so around the time of Daniel, you know, and I don't know if 600 or 400, but it's the oldest, oldest writing of the word God or the name God, in the world at that time. I think it still is, probably. That was pretty neat. It was written on stone. So you, no wonder I could see it. No wonder it was preserved well, because it was written on stone. So some ancient writing was done on stone. Other ancient writing was done on clay. Sometimes it was clay tablets, you know, if you got a tablet or an iPod, uh, iPad or, you know, a Google tablet or something like that. I don't know what they have, but... Uh, they had tablets too, and what they would do is they'd have wet clay, and they would write stuff on it, and then sometimes later on they'd just scrape it off or wipe it out, and they could rewrite again. It's like an ancient Etch-a-Sketch or something. I don't know. But uh, they wrote on clay. One of the ways that it was preserved was when not just clay tablets, but you would see them on these clay pots and jars that are kind of elongated, and that's the picture on the screen is... is um, ancient writing that was done in one of these uh, jars or cylinders. Then we've got wood. Wood was an object, obviously, people wrote on. It wouldn't last as long. But then we get into the ones that, where we really find the scriptures written on things like this. Papyrus is a paper-like uh, product made from reeds of the of papyrus plant that was found in northern Africa. And it was used widely, used widely, uh, during the time of the end of the Old Testament going into the New Testament. However, by the time we get to the New Testament, vellum has widely replaced papyri, papyrus. So vellum is going to be where they take an animal skin and they tan it and they, they, they shave it down and get it really super thin so it's still malleable a little bit, but you can write on it. And these vellum uh, manuscripts are some of the most important ones that we have uh, that give us the transmission of the biblical text. And then these vellums or papyri, they could be stitched together, glued together, and then formed into scrolls where they would be rolled up on a piece of wood or a piece of uh, clay that's been formed into like a bar. And uh, we have a lot of those that have been found as well. 
Let's see. So real quick, I want to talk to you. Oh, and then, see, I think I'm getting off on my clicker. Codexes are the opposite of scrolls. So scrolls are rolled up and stitched together. Codex is what, an early book form. So if that, someone says a codex, that just means book form. It's been bound like a book with leaves in it. We would call them pages, but they called them leaves. Okay. So let's look at the Old Testament. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Uh, what you see up here is the... Each line represents a different form of Hebrew, as Hebrew has kind of adapted. We could use the word evolved. It's evolved through the ages. So eventually, um, you know, the Hebrew you would probably recognize is a square script, square script Hebrew with vowel symbols. But the Hebrew the Bible was written in, a lot of it was written in Paleo-Hebrew, and then later on written in square script Hebrew. So if, you look, if you're looking at the... The pictures up here, these are, this form is Paleo-Hebrew, 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 and then we've got uh, more modernized uh, Hebrew, the time of in between the Testaments. It gets to this form after Jesus comes along right here, square script Hebrew, and then eventually you're going to get, let's see if i got a picture of it here. I think I have a picture. Let me go back. Yeah, so if you can see this Hebrew, there's little dots and symbols under each of the letters, and that is the attempt of the Masoretes, who were a family. The Masoretes tried to preserve the way the early words were pronounced before it was lost. The truth is, some of it may have already been lost by then, but they tried to preserve it based on what they knew. Uh, the Masoretes are interesting, because without them, we wouldn't have had the Old Testament Bible for... Two, almost 2,000 years. They preserved it for us. These are a group of people who formed about AD 400, 500, and they said, you know what? We're going to dedicate our life. It was a family. They said, we're going to dedicate our life to, transcri to, to, to copying, transcribing the Old Testament scriptures. And they did that for 500 years. So generations after generations, they even broke into branches, and there were different branches that would do different things. And I wanted to share with you um, some of the rules that they had for copying the Scriptures. Now, when someone tells you that, oh, you know the Scriptures were changed by men during, you know, during its transmission through the years, here's the rules that the Masoretes used to copy the Scriptures. Listen to this. Must be written on the skins of clean animals must be prepared for synagogue use by a Jew only, must be fastened together with strings taken from clean animals. Clean is not dirty, it's, un, it's as opposed to unclean, okay? Uh, each skin must contain an exact number of columns which must be equal throughout the entire manuscript. The length of each column must be between 48 and 60 lines. The breadth of each column must consist of 30 letters. The whole copy must be first lined. If three words were written without a line, it was considered worthless. Now keep in mind, they also memorized exactly how many letters were in each line, how many lines were in each book, and how many uh, pages or leaves each book, how many columns each book would take up. They knew exactly what the exact center word of every single book that they copied was and where it should be on the paper. So that if they made just the tiniest error, they would be able to realize it. And you know what they did to a paper that had an error on it? They burned it and they destroyed it. So what we're going to find is we're going to have Masoretic text, or the, the text from the Masoretes is going to, uh, we've got some that are going to show up about 800 B.C. Well, where are the ones from 500, 600, 700? When a parchment, when a piece of paper got too old to read or too old to be moved around and stored, you know what they did with it? They burned it. So they burned anything that allowed the Scripture to be misunderstood or leave out a part or a part uh, not be understood. If the whole copy must be, I said that, the ink must be black only and prepared according to a special recipe that was used for only copying of the Scripture. The original use to make the copy, the original use to make the copy must be authentic and must not be deviated from the copyist and the scribe must say each word aloud as he wrote it. Teachers, how would you like that in your room? 
copy this paragraph down, and everybody in there starts going, the bear went to the store. You know, that would be crazy. Uh, but they had to say each word out loud. No word or letter could ever be written from memory. The scribe must always look first at the original before writing his copy. A space of a hair or thread must intervene between each consonant. The space of a breadth of nine consonants must come between each, each section. No word must ever touch another. A space of three lines must come between every book. The fifth book of note, Moses, Deuteronomy, must end exactly with a line. Before copying, the scribe must wash his whole body. While copying, the scribe must only write the name of God with a pen newly dipped into the ink. And I've heard that one both ways. Not newly dipped so it doesn't smear or newly dipped so that it comes out perfect. You know. Each time the scribe came across the Hebrew word for God, he had to wipe his pen clean and then dip it newly in ink. And when he came across the name of God, Y-H-W-H, he had to wash his whole body before he could write that name. I hope he didn't find a scripture where it was, a, and God said this, and God did that, and God said, yeah, I mean, how many baths would the guy have to take just to get through that section? Should a king address the scribe while writing that name, he must take no notice of him. If a sheet of parchment had one mistake on it, the sheet was condemned. If there were three mistakes found on any page, the whole manuscript was condemned. Each scroll had to be checked within 30 days of its writing or it was considered unholy and every word and letter was counted and if a letter or word was omitted, the manuscript was condemned. So, you tell me, if that's the standard that they used in copying the text, do you think they made a lot of errors in the text? I don't think so. So, these are the, criti these are the manuscripts we get from them that gave us a Hebrew Bible that we translate into English from. And uh, 1975, on the bottom, the Hebrew Uni University Bible. Uh, most common one used is uh, the farthest one on the right, 2015, the Hebrew Bible, a critical edition. And so the Biblia Hebraica, all these are on here, and they all come from the Masoretic text. So you may wonder, well, how good did they do? Well, they did great. Because in the late 1940s, there was a young shepherd boy throwing rocks into a cave, and he hears, a, he hears something smash inside the cave. And he says, oh, what was that? And he walks in, and he finds in the area of Qumran, okay, right off the Dead Sea, he finds all these caves filled with jars, and inside the jars are manuscripts that were copied and written, Old Testament Bible, dating from 200 B.C. So we had a manuscript 900 A.D. Now we go back over 1,000 years. 1,100 years. And now all of a sudden we're finding complete manuscripts of Isaiah and all kinds of other books from the Old Testament. And so now we have a really good chance to say, well, how close is what we have to the original? You know how close it is? It's like 99.99% exactly the same. And the only differences are like different names used for different places and maybe a different number here that might not add up with the same. Like if it was 18,000 Edomites died here, this one say, might say 17,500 or say, it might say the exact number. I mean, the, that's the kind of differences we have between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Masoretic Text. It's incredible. But you're not going to hear people in your day-to-day -day life talking about this. Now they're going to come say, oh, there's no way the Bible could, could uh, you know, be true. There's no way that it, it, it could last. Yeah, it did, and it's been proven that it did. So that's the way it is with the Old Testament. The New Testament's a different story. When we go to the New Testament, what we're going to see, what's going to give the evidence is the amount of manuscript evidence that we have. So in the Old Testament, we were looking at the integrity of the copying of the manuscript and how it was preserved. In the New Testament, we're not going to look as much at integrity, but guess what? We have 5,000 pieces of manuscripts of the, of the New Testament. And what I mean by manuscript is original language, Greek. 
Okay, so when you use, it's not counting translations, it's not counting other people writing about it. When we say manuscript, we're talking about the scripture in its original language that it was originally wrote in. 5,000. That's, that's pretty incredible. That's overwhelming. So you tell me, if you had a classroom in school, and they have 100 kids in the class, and you give them all um, a paragraph to copy, and you say, here, copy this down. Now, if you went back and graded all those hundreds, teachers, would you have some errors? Would you have some people that didn't copy? Would they skip a line here or there? Would they skip words? Would they write some things backwards? Would they misspell a few words? Yeah, they would. But even if you didn't have the original, could you take all 100 copies that those students copied and go back and say, I think we could recreate the original from this? That's what the New Testament does. It gives us so much overwhelming evidence that we can go back and create the original. Now, just for comparison, Plato, the works of Plato, nobody questions, this come from Plato? Did he really write this? Nobody questions that, right? Well, look at the evidence for the works of Plato. Plato wrote his stuff around 400 B.C. So we're talking a 400-year difference between the New Testament and, and Plato. There are only 210 copies, including partial pieces, of Plato's works. But you don't hear critics out there today going, oh, you can't trust that. I mean, that's not even... You can't know that that's Plato or that he said those things. There's just not enough evidence out there for that. Nobody questions that. <laughs> Furthermore, of those 200 cop 210 copies, the earliest surviving manuscript we have is from AD 895. That's a thousand years. That's, that's a thousand years difference. And that's the oldest piece of work we have attributed to Plato, 895 AD. You know, and they say, nobody's questioning that. Why would you question the New Testament? Look at the New Testament evidence. Written between 49 A.D. and A.D. 96, over 5,000 manuscripts so far. I say so far because we're still discovering stuff every day. Earliest dating, the earliest of these dating to the second century, including some complete books of the Bible. So we're talking less than 100 years difference now. Compare that with Plato and, and the way they accept him. The complete New Testament together as early as the 4th century, A.D. 300s. And so when you look at the important early manuscripts, we've got P52 and P90 and P104, all from the 2nd century, Gospel of John and Matthew. We've got P64, P67. This is papyrus number. Okay, that's what the P's are, papyrus number. P64, P67, P4, 2nd or 3rd century. All four Gospels showing up here. Um, P98 has the book of Revelation, 2nd and 3rd century. P103, 2nd or 3rd century is Matthew. P75, 8200. So that's... Pretty early right there. Luke and John, P66, 200 again, John. P46 has several of Paul's letters and the book of Hebrews. P45, 3rd century, we've got Gospels and Acts. Now, those are just some of the 5,000 that we have, right? Now, these are even more important. These are important codexes. That is, they're book forms that we have that uh, we're getting the New Testament text from. Codex Sinaiticus is the oldest complete copy of the New Testament, 4th century. 4th century. I mean, that's really close to original. Codex Alexandrius. By the way, Codex Sinaiticus was found at the foot of Mount Sinai in St. Catherine's Monastery there. That's the reason it's got that name. Codex Alexandrius, Old and New Testament together, 4th and 5th century. Codex Vaticanus, 4th century. This is the main text that we had the New Testament from for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It came from the Vaticanus text before these others were discovered and, and used in the transmission translation process. Codex Ephraimi, 5th century. This is an interesting one because we've got these sermons that are written on vellum from a guy named Ephraim the Syrian. So he wrote these sermons. But what they have found is with ultraviolet light, you can take vellum and you can see how people would scrape the vellum and, re, and reuse it. Basically, he had a copy of the Bible and he had scraped it clean and wrote his sermons on it. 
A lot of people have written their sermons while scraping away the Bible, haven't they? Well, this guy uh, didn't know what he was doing. It would have been better if he hadn't scraped it, but he did scrape it, but we found it. We found it, put it under ultraviolet light. That's a very new... We've had the manuscript, but we didn't know the text was there until we could look underneath what he had written and see that he had really actually... Someone had written the New Testament on it. And then the Codex Bizet, 5th century, Greek on one side, Latin on the other. Some of y'all... Did anybody have a Spanish-English Bible here? Or a, a Bible that compares a couple of different translations? Well, this is probably this is one of the earliest ones, 5th century, Greek on one side, Latin on the other. Now, if that's not enough, lectionaries, more than 2,200 ancient lectionaries. Lectionaries are where they would organize the Scripture to be read each Sunday. So they would square it up. I guess that means i got to end. Uh, 2,200 lectionaries containing the Word of God, versions in different languages. The Syriacs, the Latin versions, the Armenian, the Gothic, the Ethiopic, Georgian versions. Some of these going back to 2nd century. And then all the early church fathers that lived from the 1st and 3rd century. You can go back and recreate the entire New Testament just from their writings. You don't even need the manuscripts. So the evidence, church, is incredible. Uh, I put these up there for you. Here's the thing. If you have a teenager or a, or a young person in your life that takes things seriously, I think you need to have these resources. If you're a father, mother, uh, aunt, uncle, if you're a Bible class teacher, I think we need to be aware of these resources and read them so that when we have questions, we can go to them. The one on the left is the new evidence that demands a verdict. It's a book this thick. It has... Evidence that shows the historicity of Jesus and all this other stuff that I've talked about to you tonight. The book on the right is specifically how we got the Bible. Now, those are good resources to have in your church library or at your home. Um, this book on the right, on the left, is from Apologetics Press. It's called Defending the Faith Study Bible. Every alleged contradiction is highlighted in the book and dealt with. It has like 40 articles, scholarly articles, written on big questions that people have about faith and specifically about the text of the Bible. Get one of these into your teenager's hands so that they can look up the answers to the questions that they're going to have and help them work through them and look through those things. Now, last, the last slide for tonight is this. When you start to read your Bible out of adoration and not obligation, then you're in a relationship with God. Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. When it comes down to it, do we want to please God? If we do, we can go to his word. And I'll say more about that. I'll say more about this, this quote. I didn't say it. I don't know who said it. I've, I'll be honest with you. It came across my Facebook feed like a few weeks ago. And I thought, oh, that'd be neat. And so I just saved the meme. And, and then when Mike asked me to, to talk about the infallibility of the, of the Scriptures, I thought I want to end with this quote. That uh, a lot of us struggle to read our Bibles, right? It's like something, you, a checklist thing you have to do. And we tell our kids, oh, you need to read your Bible. Why, why are you watching movies and playing video games and, you know, binging, been watching television shows or listening to music or read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. Until we want to, it's, it's going to be hard to really have a relationship with God. We've got to love Him in heaven more than we love the earth. And for me, for me personally, I'm learning that I have to hate the things of this world in order to love God enough, to, get, to make enough room so that I adore him so much that he's the only thing that I want. I have to learn to hate the things of this world. I think that's biblical. And thank you for your attention tonight.
as they're starting to come up, I've got a few things I want to mention. Uh, and uh, first of all, we want to thank uh, Nick for being with us tonight. I, I think we're a little unfair to Nick uh, by only giving him 35, 40 minutes for that topic. That was a lot of valuable information, a lot of uh, wonderful information that uh, I don't think um, we all ever get to see or we study for ourselves. Uh, but I would encourage you to dig deep into that stuff and how we got the Bible is, as he said, is a resource we should all have in our homes. And so I would encourage you uh, to uh, to get that and the Defending Our Faith Bible from Apologetics Press. I uh, want to make just a few um, announcements. Uh, Jocelyn Hodges is having a procedure on August the 5th and has asked for prayers. So please uh, keep Jocelyn Hodges in your prayers. Uh, also, I want to mention we currently have uh, both of our counseling slots open, so if uh, there is a need within the congregation of a member or family member, uh, please let me know, uh, and we will get that taken care of as soon as possible, but both counseling slots are open. Uh, we also uh, greatly appreciate uh, Mike Burns, uh, Wade Tummins, Dwight Stewart, uh, Keith, Braden, and Jason. They all uh, loaded up yesterday morning uh, in the van, took 155 I think cases of water uh, stopped and got some other things, took all that hand sanitizer that uh, uh, we had from uh, the flood relief here, uh, bought brooms and cleaning supplies, uh, loaded the van up, uh, and I think as they were going down the interstate it was riding like that, so they, they had a bunch of, uh, of stuff. Uh, drove over five hours uh, up into uh, eastern Kentucky, and if anybody's ever been into eastern Kentucky, there's not a whole lot but mountains and um, it's... Uh, windy roads and we appreciate them going. I know that Riley Hendricks greatly appreciated the uh, support and the help. He was there, helped unload at the school that they took it to. Uh, please continue to pray for Eastern Kentucky. Uh, the, the flooding there is unlike the flooding that we've seen here because it is so spread out in that area over a large area in the mountainous region. So uh, a lot of damage, a lot of loss of life and still searching for folks. So please remember them. But thank you to, to our folks who did that. Uh, also, uh, back to school bash this Saturday, starting at 5.30 here at the building. Food sign-up list is in the foyer. Please plan uh, and help out with that if you can. Um, if I didn't mention it, number 856, if you'd like to turn there, there will be our song of invitation. Uh, Nick will offer an invitation um, at uh, this time, and then we'll have that invitation song. Joe will have a closing prayer.
home, every car, every ease, and every freedom we would ever have. You will take that again. Would you stop reaching again or not? Would you respond to the Lord's invitation? Would you make a step tonight? Let us haste away to its spring. There's a fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Is for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call, is the fountain open for all. There's a rock that's cleft, and no soul is left that may not its pure water share. Is for you and me, and his stream I see. Let us say, Son, joyfully there. Will you come? To the fountain free, will you come? This for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call, is the fountain open for all? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, once again, we're so thankful for this period of time which we can come together, Heavenly Father, and hear your word proclaimed. We're so thankful for Brother Mitch being here with us. Father, we're thankful for Mark and his ability to lead us in song. We're thankful for each and every teacher and each and every soul in this building tonight, Heavenly Father. We ask you to continue to be with us this week until we can come together again and be with those who were mentioned who may be sick or hospitalized. Help them to get well as well. Continue to be with us and bless us as only you can. And in Christ's name I pray. Amen.